Hello, my name is Natalia Gimelshain, and today I and my colleague Kevin are going to be talking about symmetric memory in PyTorch. Have you ever wanted to program your GPU cluster not as many, but as one gigantic GPU? Symmetric memory in PyTorch brings you one step closer to being able to do just that. This talk is about symmetric memory, a new paradigm for programming distributed AI. So first, let's talk about why we decided to introduce symmetric memory to PyTorch. A little bit of history. In December 2023, we've noticed that some of our LLM inference workloads were bottlenecked by very long-running communication kernels. We've started thinking about how we could speed them up, and in December 2023, we merged the first version of the all-reduced communication kernels that are accessing directly memory in the peer GPUs. That brought the latency down a lot compared to existing kernels. But we also realized that this concept is going to be useful for more than just speeding up the existing communication routines. And we started thinking about how we could generalize it and how we could make it generally usable for developers to not just run the kernels that, are exist, that exist already, but to be able to write their own. In June 2024, the first prototype of symmetric memory APIs was merged into PyTorch, and we quickly started implementing various functions and routines that we weren't able to implement before, or that was very inconvenient to implement before. By December 2024, we had a good assortment of sped up existing routines and new approaches that we are showcasing in PyTorch. But we didn't want to stop there. It was all focused on intranode communication. And really interesting things and really interesting patterns start happening when you are scaling your workloads to multiple nodes. So that's what we are doing now, extending symmetric memory to multi-node cluster setups and working on making it more available and more convenient for developers to use to write their own kernels. Kay will talk a little bit about the challenges that we've encountered when implementing symmetric memory and symmetric memory programming model. Hi, I'm Kerr. To give you an idea of what symmetric memory looks like, we can look back at the two mechanisms two processes can talk to each other. The first mechanism is called message passing. It is similar to packing everything into a box, take it to the post office, and ship it away. As you can imagine, each packing and each ship to the post office will incur some overhead. And as a result, the communication in this kind of mechanism tends to be box synchronous. The other mechanism is called shared memory where one process can open up some of its memory space that allows direct access from the other process. In this case, the access pattern can be made faster and finer grain. Python's symmetric memory is a scale out of the second picture, where each GPU opened up some shareable space that allows the other GPUs to access. And it's not limited to internal, but internal. That's easily willed than done. One of the major challenge is to build a tensor allocation mechanism that exposes this symmetric property. In addition, we want to provide some low-level primitives such that AI programmers can focus on their algorithms only and need not worry about the low-level details. With solving these challenges, the gain is huge. Next, my colleague Natalia will show you. So what previously unavailable capabilities does symmetric memory unlock? It's based on remote direct memory access. So it's providing us with low latency and high bandwidth communications. The workloads where low latency is important will benefit from symmetric memory immediately. It's an in-kernel initiate. So you can write kernels that are interleaving communication and computation and thus improve performance by limiting the number of memory accesses. And finally, since it's a developer tool, developers can use it to write truly arbitrary communication patterns that are currently not available in existing libraries. For the rest of this talk, we'll talk about how to use symmetric memory in PyTorch, how to write your own kernel using symmetric memory, and how we scale out with symmetric memory. So first, a very simple example of using symmetric memory in PyTorch. As Kai previously mentioned, to be able to use the memory on the peer GPUs, you need to allocate it in a very specific way. 
and we are abstracting this away in the simmem empty pool that allocates the memory setting all the necessary flags. After that, you need to call rendezvous to make sure that participating GPUs exchange the information between themselves and are able to access each other's memory that they've exposed. Those calls have to be made on all the GPUs in the same order, or otherwise symmetric memory won't work. But after that, the handle provides you with pointers to the peer buffers on the other GPUs, and you can use it to write your own kernels, as shown in the example on the right, where you see that the arguments to the kernels are buffers on the peer GPUs and signal pads that you can use for communications. If you are not writing your own kernels, you can call the symmetric memory operations that are available in PyTorch today. This slide shows an example of calling one shot all reduce, which provides very low latency all reduce for small size messages. But we also provide other common communication primitives, such as broadcast all gather and reduce scatter. We've used symmetric memory to implement an interesting pattern called async tensor parallelism. To recap, tensor parallelism is a common parallelization strategy when the weights of the linear layer are sharded between the different GPUs and perform computation simultaneously. Depending on the dimension on which the weights are sharded, you have to either perform all gather on the inputs before starting the computation, or you have to reduce scatter the outputs. Those communication routines are exposed and thus can become performance bottlenecks. So how can we make sure that they are hidden and not counted in the total end-to-end -end time? We can split our computation further down so that each GPU, instead of performing one large MATMOL, is performing smaller MATMOLs. And in parallel with those MATMOLs, we are also sending the data that will be needed for the second step. This can be implemented without symmetric memory. And in fact, this was previously implemented without symmetric memory. However, there are some problems when people are implementing this pattern with nickel and not using symmetric memory. One, nickel is using SM resources to send and receive the data. And those SM resources would be unavailable for performing matrix multiplication. Thus, it will slow down the matrix multiplication. Second, Nickel communications are two-sided. That means that both sender and receiver have to call the send-receive routine, and both of them will be blocked until it completes. In many cases, we want to synchronize only when, strictly before using the data that we've received, and not use this two-sided communication routine. Symmetric memory solves both those problems, and we are able to implement async tensor parallelism using symmetric memory fully in Python, which actually eases experimentation, and with performance that's better than previously available async tensor parallelism implementations. Now, I will talk about a function that implements something that was really impossible to implement prior to symmetric memory. That's right. Another cool application of symmetric memory is mixture of aspect model, or known as MOE. MOE is a powerful architecture behind a lot of large language models today. In MOE, a token shuffle phase is necessary to exchange tokens from the attention ranks to expert ranks. This is an auto all pattern. However, because each token's experts are dynamically determined, the auto all phase with dynamic splits. As you can see in the picture here, the tokens owned by the sender have different subsets, and each subset has a length that's dynamically calculated on the GPU. If we were to use the traditional auto API, we may have to synchronize this length back to CPU and call a corresponding nickel send or receive API. This has an effect that it stores the GPU while the synchronization happens and while the CPU provide, uh, prepares the next up. With symmetric memory, we can directly consume this dynamic length in the GPU memory and remain in the same kernel instead of using synchronization. As you can see, we avoided the 
large GPU gap in the GPU timeline by symmetric memory. And in addition, without the synchronization, we can enable CUDA graph to pack all the computations, all the kernels together. And the GPU timeline with symmetric memory, as you can see on the bottom, is well packed compared to the top. Overall, we achieved up to 4x speed up compared to MOEs implemented with traditional distributed APIs. Now, all the examples presented above are just what we have in PyTorch library today. But there will be a bigger opportunity if you come to join the community and be one of the developers. Now, Natalia will show you how you can program symmetry memory with PyTorch. So what if you are trying to implement your novel parallelization strategy or want to write a kernel that interleaves computation and communication? We've already shown you previously that you can use C++ to write those kernels and shown a brief example. But no one likes to write CUDA and C++. And previously, OpenAI has released a Triton DSL that allowed a lot of people who are not expert GPU programmers to write very performant GPU code. Now we are trying to make this even better and introducing symmetric memory to Triton. So we are hoping that people who are not expert GPU programmers and not expert network programmers are nevertheless able to write their performant kernels that are doing the exact communication and computation that they want and that don't exist currently in PyTorch or in other libraries. We've integrated symmetric memory into Triton so that you can easily use the stock version of Triton and send it the buffers that symmetric memory provides you. And in Triton, you can just easily access those buffers as if it is a local memory. We are also providing a lot of convenient utilities that allow you to synchronize your writes and reads. And they are implemented in a way that clearly shows you where and how they have to be called. For example, this symmetric memory sync that you are seeing in this kernel clearly shows that you have previous memory accesses so that you need to be able to make them visible to your peers. And that kernel is going to perform subsequent memory accesses. And again, those subsequent memory accesses have to go on the valid memory. Mostly, those utilities are using native Triton, and we are using just a little bit of inline PTX where the native capabilities of Triton are not enough to do what we want. But overall, you can see that this kernel is not very different from the regular Triton kernels that you've seen previously. But you can do much more with it because you are no longer limited to just a single GPU memory. You are again looking at your multiple GPUs as if there are a single gigantic GPU. Next, Kay will talk about scaling this out to multiple nodes. Scaling symmetric memory out of a node involves a NIC that's typically uh, with RDMA capability. In traditional software stack, network communication involves the help of a CPU. In this case, the GPU will prepare the data and tell the CPU that the data is ready. Once the CPU knows about it, it rings the doorbell of the NIC with metadata, and after which, the NIC will fetch data from the GPU and send it out. This pattern, of course, involves a multi-party round trip and hence impact the performance of small messages. With symmetric memory, we want GPUs instead of CPUs talk. NVIDIA introduced a library called IBGDA, which allows GPUs to directly control the NIC. It allows the GPU threads to initiate the doorbell transaction, thus shorter round trip time. Also, we have massive amount of threads on the GPU, and thus we can issue message amount of messages at the same time, and hence bump the bandwidth. Just now, Natalia talked about how you can write Triton kernels with symmetric memory. In order for Triton kernels to go across nodes in PyTorch, we also provide a enrichment plugin for Triton. On the host side, you just need to code enrichment.enable Triton to prepare the plugin. And then inside the Triton kernel, 
you can call enrichment.api to implement some enrichment functionalities. As you can see here, putman signal to send the data to a remote rank. And also, in the kernel of a remote rank, it can wait for a signal to check the data has arrived. We've talked about using symmetric memory on a single node. We've talked about using symmetric memory on multi-node systems. So are we done here? Is everything solved? Not by a long margin. We have a lot of future plans. First, we want to support new hardware and new hardware types. We are working on adding support to NVL72 systems that link 72 GPUs with NVLink. We are also working on adding support for AMD systems and new hardware that comes out. As time goes by, it inevitably will happen that new operations will become popular, and we want to be able to write those operations and put them into PyTorch core so that they are available for everyone to use. Finally, writing kernels is fun, but what if compiler could do this for you? Wouldn't it be even better? That way, when you are slightly changing your program, you don't need to rewrite the kernels that are already there. Torch Compile will handle that for you. We want to make it happen. It didn't happen yet, but it's definitely in our future plans. As we scale out, it's inevitable that the fault problems will become very noticeable. When we are running on thousands and tens of thousands of GPUs, it's inevitable that some of those will break and will stop working and things will start failing. Making sure that we can recover from those situations and diagnose and pinpoint which exact GPU went wrong is very important and we are working on enabling fault tolerance in the symmetric memory primitives that we are currently writing. Finally, the takeaways from this talk is, I hope you are now convinced that remote access is really what you need to enable low latency and high bandwidth communications. PyTorch Distributed is turning from something that was providing functions for collective communications that you could just call into providing developer tools to enable developers themselves write the exact communication patterns that they want. We are a community, and we are excited about what you will be able to write using symmetric memory to solve the problems that you are facing. And as time goes by, the scale will become larger and larger, and symmetric memory is one of the things that's making programming at scale more accessible and available. Thank you.